And uh, here is Pastor Jay. As we begin this time, we are going to go directly to where we left off in our chronological study of the first four Gospels, where John the Baptist gives his testimony about Jesus. Let's go to NIV John, chapter 3, verse 22. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. 23. Now John also was baptizing at Enon, <laughs> Enon, near Salem, because there was plenty of water, and people were constantly coming to be baptized. 24. This was before John was put in prison. That's John the Baptist. 25. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and the, uh, a certain Jew over a matter of ceremonial washing. 26. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, <laughs> talking about Jesus, the one you testified about, well, He's baptizing, and everyone is going to him. 27. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. 28. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. Verse 30. He must become greater. I must become less. 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. 32. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Verse 33. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. 34. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. 35. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. We now continue in chapter 4 of John's Gospel. Noticing that in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was delegating his new disciples by putting them to work. Right from the beginning, doing the work of God. We're in NIV still in John chapter 4, verse 1. It says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. 2. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. <laughs> so there it is in Scripture. Three, when the Lord learned this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. At this time, Jesus decides to go way up north where Galilee is, focusing particularly on Capernaum, Nazareth, Cana, and of course the Sea of Galilee. Yet maybe it was because of his spiritual knowledge for seeing the impending persecution of his cousin, John the Baptist. Maybe Jesus knew that, well, he did. He knew this was all going to happen, so he wanted to be around. Whatever, Jesus had to pass through Samaria to get to Galilee traveling from Judea. In the time of Christ, Western Palestine was divided into three provinces. There was Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Samaria occupied the center 
of Palestine. The Talmud, which is Jewish scripture, called it Land of Kuthim. Kuthim was the father of temple singers who during the bondage there was uh, located near Babylon. And when allowed to return to Jerusalem, they settled in an area that became Samaria. Although the distance between Samaria and Jerusalem is only about 35 miles, it was never regarded as part of the Holy Land by the Jews. When Jesus travels north, he passed through this land of Samaria, he had to, and stops at a famous well called Jacob's Well, which was there in Samaria. I'm using this incident to show you how important it is to include Jesus in your commitment to one another. Whether it's in marriage, a covenant relationship, or whatever. Jesus knows our lives, past, present, and future. He knows our hang-ups and our failings. His water wells up into eternal guidance, protection, life, and love. A couple of lessons ago, we saw the miracle at the wedding in Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. Today, this symbolizes his new covenant with all mankind as the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who was crucified on the cross. Let's go to NIV, John, chapter 4, and starting in verse 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. Well, we just said <laughs> 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And six, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, verse seven, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Aha, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Eight. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. So they, they all left and just left Jesus there at the well. Nine. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Ten. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, <laughs> you would have asked him, and he would, give, would have given you living water. 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? <laughs> 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank? from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Now, in Genesis thirty-four nineteen, if you would just want to write that down, Genesis thirty-four nineteen, Jacob had purchased the plot of ground there for 100 pieces of silver, the money used at that time. And two, in Genesis 48, 22, Jacob gave the land to his son Joseph, who was a leader in Egypt by then. Remember that whole story? And three, in Joshua 24, 32, we see that Joseph's bones are buried there. Let's just go to, to uh, Joshua 24 in the NIV, the New International Version, in verse 33, it says, And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Sheshem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's 
descendants. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, if you remember. And he was the father of the land and the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> so the woman knew her history. The Samaritans had their own copy of the Pentateuch, built their own temple, and their worship was similar to that of the temple in Jerusalem. And all this because on the return from their exile under Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews refused the Samaritans' participation with them in the worship at Jerusalem. The great controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans was whether to worship at Gerishim, where the Samaritan temple was, or at Mount Moriah. Continuing on now with the woman at Jacob's well talking with Jesus. Let's go to NIV, John chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Talking about her water. 14. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's where our title, Living Water, comes from. Let's go to John, chapter 4, verse, four, verse 15, in NIV, and continuing on. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. <laughs> 16, he told her, Go, call your husband <clears throat> and come back. 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. 18. The fact is, you have five husbands. You have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. 21. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 22. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Do you worship in spirit and truth? Or do you go to some place, your church to some place, and just get together and, and follow along with the crowd and nothing much is happening in here. The Father needs those who worship Him in themselves, not for others to see. It's wonderful to raise your hands and, and uh, get on your face and, and do all kinds of things like that. But if you're just doing that for a show, speaking in tongues and just doing it as a show to, to try to make people think you're more religious than they are, nothing's happening. God would rather have you worship in your closet <laughs> where no one can see. 24. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. 26. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? The, the disciples returned and were surprised. Why? 
when we go out with our brothers and sisters and maybe leave one alone, maybe you're going to visit Las Vegas and it looks like one is just getting off base a little bit. Maybe that's what the disciples were thinking. Hey, why are you over here? You know, no, it wasn't like today when a pastor might be backsliding a little. Actually, it was because they still looked to Jesus as a rabbi, a Jewish teacher. And in Jewish etiquette and the Talmud, it was forbidden for rabbis to converse with women in public, in a public place. Did you know that? Or instruct them in the law. At least that's what I've been taught. No rabbi was even to converse with his wife, sister, or daughter in, a, in public or on the street. Now, I'm not a rabbi, and, and, and I haven't studied, but you might talk to one and find out if that's true. But this is why they were surprised. NIV John, uh, chapter 4, verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to, to the town and said to the people, 29, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. He was saying to his disciples. 33. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. We're all here, not to, because it's a good party here on earth. <laughs> he has a bigger plan. I really believe that this is almost a training ground for what is to come. So much greater. It's so much greater what he has planned. And we're all being prepared for that. And those who will just surrender him totally and do his work here on earth will also be working for him in this eternity that he has planned. Here's another great principle of life. The best of life is to do God's will and to accomplish what we are here for. In our natural life, nothing stimulates, keeps alive, or encourages us more than seeing success in the mission one is dedicated to bring about. Let's go to uh, John 4, and now verse 35. It says, Do you not say, Four months more, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. 36. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. 37. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. 38. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I, have ever, I ever did, she said. 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. 41. And because of his words, many were, many more became believers. <laughs> 42. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we, we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Here we have seen the first lesson on missionary work. In verse 25, Jesus says that it would be four months until harvest. 
Therefore, it had to be around December at that time. Jesus is no doubt referring to the Samaritans coming out of the city to hear him. The harvest of souls was already at hand, produced in one day. The lesson for us is that we are not to sit and wait four months for spiritual harvest. We can see an immediate harvest if we sow the seed. Jesus did it here. He was the sower and the reaper rejoicing over the harvest all in one person in one day. From this woman, Jesus caused a revival that lasted for two days. Verse 42 shows us that we can hear about Jesus and have a desire to know him. But to really know him, we have to have a personal relationship. Like the Samaritans of the city, we have to come out of our familiar surroundings and seek him and hear him speak to us personally. We will find Jesus still lives today and wants to be our friend, to guide us through every situation in our lives. And when our lives end on this earth, take us to his home, to be with him for an eternity. The Bible says in Revelation that the water flows from under the temple and it comes down through the, the rivers and there's, there's just the trees and there's healing in the leaves. It goes into all nations. It's healing us right now when we come to him. We can have that now. The water of life without You can count on that too.